Hi, um, I would like to start with a story. While on a walking tour of Old Delhi by a historian, we stopped in front of a thelewala, um, a street vendor selling fruits and vegetables on a cart. And our guide asked us if we could identify the indigenous vegetables and fruits on that cart. A few confident guesses went awry. We couldn't. It was impossible to think of onions and tomatoes and green chilies as foreign. But arguably, they were. They were brought to the Indian subcontinent by the Portu Portuguese conquistadores, transplanted from the Americas and introduced into the soil and then to Indian palates, quickly becoming staples in our various foods. What does that say about human and non-human movement? How do gardens function as colonial archives? The work, the work is situated in Lahore, a city in Punjab in Pakistan. Lahore is an ancient city and it has been ruled, among others, by the Mughals, the Sikhs, the British, and post-independence Pakistani governments. All these regimes have built gardens, enough for it to have gained recognition as a city of gardens in Pakistan. The Mughals brought with them the Persian style of Chaharbagh gardens. The Sikhs continued in the botanical directive formalized by the Mughals, and the British brought with them Victorian and Edwardian styles of gardening. I was drawn to interpreting gardens, their layouts, the varieties as a process of unpacking governance and making intelligible these different regimes that didn't just transplant trees, fruits, and flowers, but implanted and sowed ideas and culture and lifestyles and embedded identity through these gardens upon a place. How do trees and plants calculate time? And how does soil witness the temporality of history and the shifts of space. I created the first iteration of a visual installation project called What Do the Trees Tell Us in 2017. In its first version, it took the shape of a two-channel projection. The work moves us through various historic gardens and green belts in the city, some extant, some imagined. It traverses through preserved gardens and the ruins of what were once gardens. The video's narrative contemplates the significance of empire and colonialism and the path that Lahore has embarked upon towards modernity. These are flexible shifts through time and space, reality and memory, past and present, dream and desire. As the video develops, we begin to feel the weight of history, memory, and nostalgia as it impacts those who live in the city of Lahore and call it home. Mark Dion's cross-section of a redwood tree lays bare the cross-section of history and space in, ex in an expanded sense, hinting at a forensic appreciation of time as witnessed, experienced, and suffered by a redwood tree before being chopped to make a picnic table. Ito Barada's work is a tongue-in-cheek set of instructions for governors to prune and present the vegetative and arboreal landscape in the best light possible for quick viewership. Jan Vericruez has created beautifully rendered illustrative maps of varied gardens. These maps can be instructions, a manual, proposed drawings, or illustrated fables. I looked at these works to think on what possible future gardens in Lahore could look like, perhaps in, say, 2025. For now, though, we are beginning to see date palms everywhere in Lahore. These have become ubiquitous, and the optics of these palm fronds become signifiers for Saudi influences, interpretations of what a Muslim country should look like, and Saudi money and control. So this work locates the echoes of other trees associated with Lahore in the shadows of the date palm. This is the Amaltas and the people tree. And of course, date palms cannot thrive in Lahore. It cannot even survive. It burns up every year and is replanted. It cannot provide shade nor fruit. In a, in a utilitarian world, it is useless to us. Lastly, I want to look at land value and the economies of farming, which, is te which are temporal as it is based on fluctuating market rates. I want to share some drawings of a mango orchard as a permanent installation. Mangoes in our part of the world are considered to be the king of fruits. Ghalib even composed verses on them. Mangoes are planted in Pakistan, in Sindh and Punjab, and they yield different varieties. On a personal side note, my maternal grandparents migrated to Pakistan in 47 and acquired land in South Punjab, inherited land, suddenly becoming landowners. Um, so the text on the right earlier is from a story I wrote on the emotional journey of mangoes. The sketch or blueprint is based on interviews conducted with farmers in Punjab and Sindh and their lived experience of mango farming, creating orchards which are, as one farmer told me, a permanent installation upon the land. Um, I'm going to move now to uh, sharing, some, sharing two video extracts from the earlier work that I mentioned.
कहते हैं ढूंढने वाले को खुदा भी मिल जाता है मगर मुझे तो सिर्फ उस पौधे की तलाश है जिसके पत्तों में पानी की बूंदें चांदी दिखती हैं date palms in lahore Rachel Bride Ashton, a painter from Scotland, and this is May Murad, a painter from Gaza. Um, and I'm going to talk about our project Walking Without Walls, which is a very simple, literal transcultural exchange. Uh, a year-long digital communication during which we both became friends, uh, but only on Skype. We've never actually met. Uh, we began by talking on WhatsApp, showing photos and videos of our homes and families to each other. Uh, we took each other on virtual walks to map out tandem walking marathons plan for the end of the project. The project was carried out as a residency with uh, Devon, Devon Projects, a small arts organisation in the town of Huntley in the northeast of Scotland. Um, this is us talking to me on Skype, me and the director Claudia, and an artist who spoke Arabic who helped with translation in the early days, but May's English improved very fast, unlike my Arabic. Um, we, began, we started mini, explore, mini explorations into our own landscape through its wild flora. These are some pages from my plant journals. We catalogued the plants along our marathon routes, inspired by the journals of Rosa Luxemburg. Plants have always been an interest of mine, their ability to repair the earth and to heal us. Um, and we looked into their edibility and medicinal properties in more depth and compared plants between the two countries. These are um, pages from May's journals. This was a new experience for her. She'd never done anything like this. She found it quite difficult to find the names of uh, plants as there's a loss of plant knowledge in both Gaza and the UK, although there's a small revival maybe starting in the UK. Um, but she eventually found a herbalist in Gaza who helped her a little. Um, these are my paintings from before the project began. My practice is split between um, trying to earn a living, selling paintings which tend to be of the local rural landscape um, and looking at more personal issues. Uh, I've developed a sort of exaggerated visual code for describing the shapes and colours of my familiar Scottish landscape, which was about to be challenged. These are May's paintings from before the collaboration. Um, Claudia asked her why she painted everything grey, and she answered that she sees Gaza as grey, as a world of ashes. Uh, this is a long story. She'd never painted landscape before this project, only figures which she uses to express her emotions. This was also about to be challenged. These are our often daily WhatsApp communications where we discuss the difficulties May faced in everyday life, um, things like electricity shortages, limits to freedom. We talked about our future. We talked about my house fire. And sometimes we managed some lighter conversation about family and work and food. Um, this next one is a painting of May's generator, which I did, um, that she has in Gaza. And I recognize it instantly because we have the same generator pictured here. Um, we also use the same system of batteries to store power, but for me this is a sort of chosen off-grid uh, lifestyle which represents freedom, and for me it uh, represents obviously the opposite, it's not, not the chosen way. Uh, we began to paint each other's landscapes. Um, I found it quite hard at first, it felt quite conceited to think I could paint someone else's land. Uh, I hid, hid to begin with in the greenery of our grandparents' garden, um, and then began to explore my more complex feelings through poetry and through a series of paintings of the entrance to a refugee camp. These are May's paintings of my landscape in Scotland. She says there's lots of nature in Gaza, but because of the sad conditions, it's impossible to enjoy them. Uh, she loved all the green in Scotland and the big skies, and I sent her mostly videos of the countryside surrounding my home as I live rurally. She says she really found herself in these landscapes. Uh, we continued mapping out our slow marathon routes, um, and in Scotland we were doing some training for this challenging walk. I faced very difficult weather conditions, but we like to moan about the weather in Scotland. Um, we had to navigate miles of forestry tracks and not get lost in the snow, which I did. 
and try and avoid dangerous roads um, with no verges or pavements and angry farmers. Here is me mapping out in quite different scenery. The Gaza Strip is 42 kilometres long, um, which is coincidentally exactly marathon length. Um, while filming on the route, she and her friends were harassed and questioned as to why they were filming, and one of her friends was threatened with investigation. That's the kind of thing that she had to deal with, um, which thankfully didn't happen in the end. This is our exhibition launch event in Scotland. Uh, May couldn't join us live, but she sent um, a video of her talking. Um, we displayed some of our work here physically and digitally. We had two speakers who talked about political walking and the Palestinian situation. And we revealed the marathon routes to uh, the walkers for the, the walk the next day. Here are the, marath uh, the marathon walkers assembled in Gaza. May managed to gather about 40 people, which is more than we expected. Um, they only got permission to do the walk days before the event. It's not easy walking in Gaza um, in large groups. You need a permit and there's lots of questions asked and complications. So we were surprised and delighted that they got to do it in the end. This is their starting point in the north. This is our marathon. We had a piper to pipe us on our way. Uh, 70 walkers all spread out. Not, we didn't walk together like in Gaza, which is why we needed the maps because it was a very complicated route. Uh, May and I managed to communicate a few times en route um, and sent photos and videos of... Uh, of the walk to each other and we shared them with the other walkers so it felt like we were doing the walk together. This is an aerial photograph of the Gaza walk. Um, I think it looked much harder for them as they didn't manage any training because of the restrictions um, in Gaza and they were walking on tarmac the whole way and by Scottish standards it looks very hot uh, but May just described it as a beautifully sunny day. We had music on both marathons. This is my brother playing song, peace songs to cheer the walkers on for the last five miles. Uh, and then when we were back, we waited to hear from uh, Gaza to see that they'd arrived back safely as well. And then we all celebrated with Middle Eastern food and shared photos and stories from the walks in both countries. Um, they had music in Gaza too. They had musicians walk with them and play. And here they are stopping for a rest and listening to the musicians. Um, at the end of, um, of their marathon, they celebrated by singing a great protest song, which you can hear in a short film that we had made about our project, which is just called Walking Without Walls and is on YouTube. The film premiered in London at the Tate Modern. This next slide is of it, uh, of it there, and also in Huntley and Gaza at the same time. We were all hooked up on Skype to, go, uh, to watch it together. Um, and one day, May and I still hope to meet without a screen between us. Uh, May is now in Jordan, and I've just discovered it's her birthday today. And she's going to be watching this video in a few moments when we post it, so I'm going to say happy birthday to May. And thank you for inviting me to speak here. Pharmacy. No. So thank you for having me here. Well, no, our project, uh, the Artist Residency Belo Jardim, is located in the countryside of Pernambuco, 190 kilometers away from Recife, the capital city. We are in the northeast region, the oldest part of Brazil. Pernambuco was the first land to, get, to give profit to Portugal. Pernambuco is also the birthplace of Gilberto Freire, the author who, uh, whose theory, theory of lusotropicalism, contributed to the Portuguese notion that they were the best colonizers of the world and helped Salazar, the dictator of Portugal, to legitimize the colonization in Africa even during the independence war. So, uh, with the decay of the sugarcane, uh, economical cycle, Northeast became the subaltern of Brazil, a place of the anachronics, an anachronistic uh, past and not so bright people. Uh, but this changed a lot during the Lula government, who, who, is also, uh, who was also bo uh, born in Pernambuco. So Belo Jardim is a small city of 70,000 people, for Brazil's standard, is a small city, with a strong music tradition and without cinemas or art centers. But it is the main place for the biggest car battery company in Latin America, Baterias Moura. Uh, so, um, so who is our commissioner and supporter? Instituto Conceição Moura is the cultural part of the company, and they want to retribute all that they took off 
uh, the, 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 the land and the, the place. So Kiki Mazzucchelli, who is a, a curator from Sao Paulo, and she established in London, and me, who is from Recife, and now I live in Lisbon, we were invited in 2016 to develop an artist residency uh, there, and our main concern was not to create another sexy residency for bored artists who go place after another place in a hunger for another, the next exotic destination, but try to develop a respectful, meaningful, and sustainable exchange project or dynamics with this place and people in a time frame of 10 years. So uh, we just finished the second edition. In the first two editions, we saw it as an exploratory phase, as we don't have a previous model to implement. We want to create dynamics or models with the experience of being there and doing it. So the first two years, we invited contemporary artists from Agreste region, this region, who already had connections to Belo Jardim, a kind of Trojan, Trojan horse strategy. So for two months, Marcelo Silveira, the first artist, installed and, de and developed new works in many spots of the city, like schools, the square, and the Quilombo of Barro Branco, a former slave community. Quilombo are the communities that the slaves who could, who resisted the slavery and escaped, and they started to build these communities in many parts of Brazil. Uh, so Barro Branco, uh, so he developed the project there too. Here are some pictures of the first, uh, for instance, here is Marcelo Silveira walks. People could interact, they could, uh, I don't know, it was very open, very different from a uh, white cube experience. And also he developed a lot of new walks there with local people and uh, understanding the dynamics of the city. Um, I will talk more a little bit um, afterwards. We can, with drinks, maybe is better. And um, in the second artist, Carlos Melo, made a movie with the Quilombo of Barro Branco. It was a, a, actually, it was a coincidence, and it was really interesting because um, he wanted to do a long, the, his residency uh, actually lasted four months, and he did a long listening uh, process with the community, trying to understand how this artistic movie, not a documentary, could happen. He's a white man, we, in this black community, and yeah, all these layers, he was very attentive to all his, these layers. Um, and what happens that, well, he's, he's beginning his, um, his, his part. Uh, so, of course, he did a, a movie, and he also developed a sculpture made of bones, and the community was building the, the, the script with him and building this huge... Um, huge installation. And also he opened space in this former suite company. It's all like a key, like a headquarter is where the residency stays uh, for local artists. So it was perfect because for me and Kiki, Kiki and me, Kiki and me uh, which was perfect to understand uh, a little bit better the dynamics and the agents of the city and also the questions that we can explore or you can exchange. So we, uh, uh, these two experiences of being in Belo Jardim for at least two months each year made us start to understand how to improve our listening, how to change, how to really, really um, learn from this place. Not, we, are, we don't have this fantasy of being there to enlighten them or to save them, not of this white, we are white, but we are very attentive to our, we are very self-reflective with this. Um, and so for ne the next two years, we want to, every two years we want to, uh, to change. We are very flexible. So for the next two years, we, we are not uh, concentrating anymore in only artists. We want to do our open call so we can have more polyphony. And we already know a lot of people who can, ooh, who can work with us, the local artists. And uh, what else? Okay, the local writers will be part of our main team. And the most important thing is exactly to... For us, is the, the, the key words of our project is long-term, small-scale, one-to-one, 
relationship is all bad for a refreshing way to do transcultural exchange. I know it's, it's privilege, our project. We don't have answers yet, but a lot of questions, and we believe that decolonize is not a recipe, but a long, tough, painful process for everybody involved in a project that means to be not only, uh, not only a, art, a contemporary art project, we don't want to, have to be zoo, like a zoological, cultural zoological project. So that's it. I'm sorry, I'm very bad about timing. Um, I'm not a Germanic person. And I've, I made math very bad. I, thought it, I just had three minutes, so that's it. I hope that we can talk more because it's 10 years in six minutes. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>